Thank you all for coming, and I hope you're not too sleepy after lunch. We're gonna try to be lively for you. Um, this is a lively panel because we're talking about the technical challenges of trying to audit digital platforms and bring a human rights-based approach to regulation. And that is a really challenging issue, and many of the people up here are working on it very hard and have a lot of interesting things to say. And there's a lot of room for disagreement in this area. So um, I'm gonna start with just a little introduction about myself and my work, and then I'm gonna bring it to each one of um, our panelists. And then as you know from previous sessions, I'll be opening it up for comments from stakeholder groups and I'll call out and ask you to keep those short. So I'll just start with myself. I'm Julia Angwin, I'm a journalist. I um, grew up in Silicon Valley and learned to code in fifth grade and really thought that I was gonna be a technologist, but fell in love with journalism to my parents' great chagrin. <laughs> and, um, then went on to write about technology and use technology and use data scientists in the newsroom to help do my investigations. And I really believe that um, we need to use every tool we have on behalf of the public to investigate these complex systems because they don't reveal themselves um, without a lot of data. The reality is, as you all know, is that you can write an anecdote, oh, this one bad thing happened, on one platform, and it's hard to know, is that indicative of a trend or is it just a one-time thing? And so you need large amounts of data to make conclusions about what's really happening on these platforms. And so I've spent a lot of time investing in technological skills and building a newsroom, the markup that I founded, that was half technologists and half journalists who worked on using um, their engineering and automation skills to collect data to allow us to analyze it. And I think that has been um, really fruitful. We did a project called Citizen Browser where we decided to try to understand what was Facebook recommending to its users. And that was a challenge to figure out. We ended up paying people to participate in our survey and install a tool that allowed us to see their Facebook feed. And we would take a snapshot of it and then remove all the personally identifying details and then analyze that information to see if we can make some conclusions about whether Facebook was living up to the promises it had made. And big surprise, they were not. Um, so I want to um, now move on to um, start with um, Prabhat, who is in charge of implementing the most ambitious regulations, um, the DMA and the DSA, and have him tell us what they're doing to um, use technical overcome these technical challenges. Thanks, uh, Julia. I, it's a challenge <laughs> to be here in the, uh, the afternoon. So indeed, uh, I'm Prabhat from the European Commission, and I'm responsible for the Digital Services Act, and until recently also on, for the Digital Markets Act, um, together with a bunch of other colleagues in the European Commission. And so, some of you might be following this uh, file closely and the developments and you know, the main news here is that um, the powers that the commission has now um, are going live at the moment uh, to regulate the largest platforms in the European Union. Uh, we're in the process of setting ourselves up right now to take on these powers and a big part of this is a little bit, Julia, like what you did at the markup, you know, half journalists, half technologists and so, we don't have the journalistic half, but we have the legal half, you know, and we're trying to build up the technological half. Um, and of course, three things to start with. We know that what we are regulating is a very complex technological entity um, that, you know, uses the most sophisticated um, tools that are out there. So. That means that as a regulator, we need to become more sophisticated as well. We need to learn how to uh, read the tools and read the science. So we're particularly working there with a newly established center on algorithmic transparency. And um, we'll be recruiting a lot of experts. Uh, I think I can reveal that we will also work with Ruman here, who is on this, uh, uh, on this, on this panel. Um, 
but uh, we're building up this capacity now. Uh, we're in the process of doing so. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we're setting ourselves up to be using our powers, to be asking the right questions, to be uh, understanding what we are regulating, how to regulate it best. And uh, it's, I would say, beginning of an exciting journey. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, before we move on, I want to just ask one question that I know you get all the time, but I'd like to hear from you on this, which is that um, you know there's been the history with GDPR. A lot of people have believed that it wasn't um, that well enforced, and so I think you have to overcome some of the technical challenges there. And one challenge there was there was not a, um, a regulatory body that was set up to establish. Um, to, to enforce the law. And so I, I would love to hear a little bit from you about um, how you plan to overcome that. And indeed, this was a, a big part of the discussions in the um, design and the legislative process of the Digital Services Act. And, and the end result was that there was a very strong, overwhelming agreement um, that the powers should rest with the European Commission to enforce uh, the rules for the very large online platforms. And, and partly it's um, you, you know, we are able to federate different countries and, and expertise from everywhere. And we also know from the antitrust area that companies listen to the European Commission more than they might listen to individual national regulators. I think that was the main difference with the GDPR, where there is a cooperation mechanism, by the way, the Commission is going to consult on improvements to it, but the main regulator was kept at a national level in the country of establishment. So I, I hope that this is going to make a, a difference. I think the initial signs are encouraging. Um, I think we've seen some good, very early compliance with the first rule that was applicable as of last Friday, that companies had to publish their user numbers. You know, Even though we didn't quite get the level of detail that we wanted to, and we've, we'll be following up with the companies on that, but we've seen pretty good compliance with, uh, with the very first rule, so I'm optimistic. Great. Um, so now we'll move to um, uh, ministers. I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna mess this up. Sto Stomenova, do um, so um, from Slovenia, and uh, wanted to talk uh, about what your thoughts were about um, what algorithms should be disclosed, what the platforms should be revealing, and how these aud audits should be conducted. Oh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with all the panelists uh, and, of course, with uh, our great moderator. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, the responsible person for DSA is here with us in our country. We started the open debate about that just this week, and we see many, uh, not uh, problems, but challenges that we are going to solve. Uh, so <coughs> the problem with the algorithms, and this was also, it came up uh, at our debate. The first question was like, okay, but the platforms are using uh, algorithms to monetize, to earn profit. So uh, maybe we should start at that point. And uh, is it the right way to start at the end, to regulate, or maybe to uh, start at the beginning? So what is uh, the cost? Uh, but uh, of course we are here now. And um, when we were discussing uh, what uh, uh, should the platforms disclose, it was like, uh, why does the platform recommend certain content to me? So why, why to me and why uh, different contact to you? So uh, the information on the role of the um, recommendation algorithms. Then another question was uh, why uh, I see certain ads? So uh, how the algorithms, uh, how the platforms are using what kind of algorithms uh, to advertise? This is another information that should be um, hidden no more. <laughs> uh, then, um, so why algorithms delete certain types of content? What types of content and why these uh, content moderation algorithms uh, so that are used uh, should be revealed? And another thing that came up to my mind uh, earlier this uh, morning, uh, it was also who is moderating the content? Natalia was speaking about that as well. It would be good to know. Uh, then another thing is the algorithms for the dissemination and amplification of misleading and false information. So why does some um, data, some information come earlier than other data? Uh, 
then the impact of algorithms on freedom of expression uh, and fundamental rights. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we must make sure that the role of algorithms should be clear to all the users uh, of the platform services. So maybe just uh, this, uh, for a beginning, these are the things that uh, should be revealed uh, to the users. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to you, Lena, as an engineer um, and uh, the head of, um, sorry, Cybersecurity National Advisor um, of Lebanon, um, to talk about the engineering challenges of what is involved in trying to answer the questions that have been raised. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Uh, thank you for, uh, I'm very glad to be in this panel with a very important subject regarding, uh, first of all, I would like to thank UNESCO for these guidelines, because uh, guidelines is something very important, even uh, when we talk about uh, international community, Europe, because I'm working on uh, advanced counter-terrorism project uh, for Lebanon with the European community. Uh, commission. So the problem regarding the technical issues that human rights and digital uh, and digital platforms are interrelated, really. So with the development of the technology, we have we should follow also with the human rights. The approach might change because of technical uh, technological issues, and I'm sure to be uh, to talk about regulation, technically is a very complicated issue. And even if you have transparency, that does not solve technical problems. I mean, uh, now when we talk about algorithm, they are no more uh, only assets. They might be subject to discuss, to evaluate, to access. And especially in this uh, rapid change and rapid use of technology after COVID, government, communities, industries are really overwhelmed with the quantity of information to address. Technical issues are very complicated. So I can say that a regulation platform and digital platform for uh, human rights, whatever, whatever, are critical infrastructure by themselves. When we talk about critical infrastructure, we should address all problems related to... Part of them are technical, social, legal, uh, uh, and all type of, uh, of uh, sectors, they are multi-sectorial problems which affect and technology is responsible of consolidating that. For example, in, if I take one example of AI, you have the data. The underlying cause of removal for any item is a technical decision. So the underlying reason of removing data is a very big responsibility. If the platform is using available data to remove, it's a matching process normal. But what about prediction online, audio, video, everything together, that you might need real-time system also to assess while you are regulating? So even if we work in a transparent manner, we are not sure that this will solve technical problems. So this uh, the challenges I wanted to highlight uh, Thank Multi you. <laughs> multidisciplinary technical problems. Thank you so much. Um, I think on that, we'll move to Runman, who's been uh, leading a team assessing risks, most recently inside of Twitter, um, and, and can talk about some of the things that she has done that have been pretty impressive, like looking at um, studies of bias within the system and um, figure out ways to understand why the cropping algorithm was um, making such weird decisions. So I'll leave it to you to describe the work and, um, and what we can learn from it. Sure. Thank you, Julia. Really excited to be on this panel, and thank you, UNESCO, for pulling this really brilliant conference together. Uh, so as, as Julia had said, uh, my name is Dr. Aman Chowdhury. Um, I am a data scientist and a social scientist, and I think about the impact of algorithms on society. Most recently, until last November, I was the director of machine learning ethics, transparency, and accountability at Twitter. And some of the research that Julia has mentioned, um, I think importantly for this crowd, is um, our research on the algorithmic amplification of political perspectives on our Twitter home timeline algorithm, which demonstrated that in seven out of eight Western democracies, the home timeline algorithmic system was promoting center-right content. Um, and it's interesting to tackle these problems 
from a socio-technical perspective, so to take that word apart, quite literally the social and the technical, I think all of which is represented on this panel. Um, so the work I do today, since being laid off from Twitter, thankfully, probably one of the few times you'll hear, thank, thank goodness I got laid off, um, is to really think through these problems as it relates to, as Pravat had mentioned, a regulatory perspective. So as we start to build laws and define the need for, al for algorithmic oversight, what does that meaningfully look like? And as somebody who's been on the inside, I can provide perspectives on what resources are available at companies, what we can and cannot expect companies to be able to do in a reasonable manner. Uh, and also the other thing I think through a lot are technical implementations to be able to scale these audits. So if we are going to ask very large online platforms to provide annual audits of all of the different systems, that is actually quite a big task. So I'm also thinking through defining who is an auditor, who gets access, uh, what does it mean to develop an audit. So all these are really fascinating open questions, and I'm sure we'll discuss some of them on this panel, but also literally in the years ahead. Absolutely. Um, and I have follow-up questions on your research, but I want to move first to Gabenga and have him talk about um, what um, are we missing by being North-centric in this conversation and some of um, your interesting points you've raised about um, how we should be talking more about protocols. Thank you. Uh, in two days on Saturday, my home country, Nigeria, will go to elections. Um, the first of two general elections, and the conversation around regulation of platforms was very popular. Uh, you know, a few months ago, as governments, you know, kept talking about the need to regulate, uh, but it wasn't a strange conversation for me and for many of you know uh, those of us who work in civil society because there's a difference between the trans what regulation translates to for many governments and what it truly means. When we talk about regulation here, we're thinking of standards. But there are many governments who are thinking of regulation in terms of control. And that, I think, is a fundamental challenge. You know, and, and when you then move on to, say, conversations around how do we then regulate in terms of creating standards, you also get into a bit of trouble because what you're trying to regulate as a sector are platforms that are independent in terms of creating world gardens for themselves. Um, as an engineering student in the late 90s myself, I was very excited about the future of the internet. I mean, I just got access to the internet and I was like, oh wow, this protocols. And as far as I was concerned, the future was extremely bright. But at some point, what was intended to be open and distributed became closed. And we created all those world gardens. And it goes to the bottom of some of the challenges we have today around business models. There is no business incentive for some of the platforms to address the challenges. And that's why you always get pushed back and where you will get tokenistic statements. And I think it's important to know that, yes, we need to define that regulation is about standards and not control, but it's also important to move away from assuming that platforms are going to have the same reaction to regulation conversations as they would have had if they were truly on, you know, as protocols. And, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, you know, I want to move to the question you asked about uh, Global North and Global South. I mean, I hate to be the one to say it all the time, but it's, it's, it's really important to say this, that a lot of the conversations are focused on the Global North. And this is a problem. It's a problem because when you have those conversations, they don't translate into the same thing when they move to other countries. There are governments, we've been studying you know, uh, countries across you know, the African continent for about seven years. Uh, every year we produce a report on digital rights. And every time we produce this report, we see trends along the lines of you know, certain countries that first of all see regulation as opportunity to control. And secondly, when conversations happen, so the US parliament is discussing, oh, should we ban TikTok or not? That doesn't translate as a debate to them. It translates as an excuse, an opportunity to say, well, the US wants to ban TikTok anyway, so we ban Twitter. And I think it's important to expand this conversation and understand that the context of the global south, many countries in the global south, yes, they're democratic countries, but this is a, you know, this is a region where institutions are still struggling with independence where people has, which is one of the reasons why Saturday is a, an extremely important day in Nigeria, because whoever becomes president literally becomes the most powerful person and can say to even institutions, the current presidents in Nigeria uh, disregarded completely 
the Supreme Court ruling on the, you know, the change of the currency and said, you know what, this is what I want you to do, which is against what the Supreme Court you know, has said. And I think this is why it's important for us to bring in the context of particularly civil society actors, because you make the work of civil society actors difficult in the global south when you have conversations about regulation that are sort of not focused and do not translate into standards and sound like control to those who are in the global south. Very good point. Well received. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think that that is, you've seen that already with the misinformation laws that have been passed around the world and they've been mostly used, um, I think studies have shown to um, oppress dissidents and journalists and not to actually stem any misinformation. And so there's a lot of ways that these things can be really misguided. Um, and it's worth keeping that in mind. And yet at the very same time, we have these tech giants that are so large, they're larger than any government, and I think it is a fair question to ask, can they be reined in at all? Uh, um, because the decisions they make about, for instance, what kind of speech is allowed prior to the election in Nigeria are their own. They're only accountable to themselves, and they can decide whatever they want, and they can swing the election if they want to, right? And, and sometimes they do. And so I think the question is really hard to, to figure out. I mean, we are supposed to be talking about technical challenges, but we of course have veered into all the political challenges, which is a common problem. Can I actually, yes. so thank you for your very brilliant comments. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our blog post when we actually discussed the algorithmic amplification work is exactly what you said. So what we, our observation was that there's algorithmic amplification of center-right content, right? What does that mean? So I think the surface level interpretation is, oh, there's algorithmic bias. That's actually not necessarily the case, right? So the data from that research was from April to August of 2020, when frankly, most of the world was talking about center-right content. Agree, disagree, people in the US were talking about Trump, people in EU were talking about issues in Hungary, Vienna, et cetera. So the hard part, and we actually lay this out in that post, and you're totally correct, is, my, my team, what we were following up with, which unfortunately was work we did not get to complete, was an understanding of where is this amplification coming from? And that leads to two very critical and very different pathways. And in our perspective, as we wrote, if it is algorithmic bias, so truly if we are able to do a root cause analysis and identify that for some reason our machine learning models are artificially identifying center-right content, whatever that means, and amplifying it, that is our job to fix. However, if the amplification is a function of the global narrative, then that is a wildly different conversation. Frankly, I should not be mediating that, Jack Dorsey, and definitely not Elon Musk should be mediating that. But then the question is to your point, who should? Because in some places, the government will use that amplification to stifle dissident behavior. So it, it ends up being a very geopolitical and frankly almost philosophical question of you know what is public discourse, what is the public square, who gets to be heard and why, as it gets mediated through algorithms. I um, mean, yeah, this is a problem in that we are always trying to find a global regulatory scheme, but in reality, um, it feels like there's increasing amounts of evidence that they there needs to be much more regulation at the local level. One of the main criticisms of Facebook, right, was it didn't even have people reading in content moderation who spoke the languages. And so we have seen that you do need the on the ground knowledge in order to do this work. Um, so um, I think we have somewhat failed at t technical challenges, but we have given a lot of <laughs> talk about political challenges. Um, so I want to open it up to um, stakeholder comments. And the way I've been told we're going to do this is that um, people will raise their hands and I will call on different sectors. And if you've already spoken in a previous session, um, from your sector, maybe give an opportunity to somebody new. And if you can give your keep your comments to a minute and a half, that would be great. So the first sector to be called on is the public sector. So um, if folks who have not spoken before want to add their voice from the public sector on technical or political challenges, since we've addressed both, um, 
uh, you in the blue sweater. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I, my name's Janet Love. I'm a commissioner um, uh, of the Electoral Commission in, the, in South Africa. Um, I wanted to find out uh, in relation to the work that's being done in terms of DSA, whether or not the reports that are filed will be publicly available and the extent to which there'll be a possibility for other parts of the world to engage with the EU to ensure that some of that regulatory space does not exclude unrealistically the rest of the world because we're talking about a global phenomenon and globally some of the kinds of algorithms that are applied and some of the sort of data that is being required in the EU would be really important for other parts of the world. And it seems to me the leverage the EU has is of such significance that it would be a waste for the EU to try and contain it as the EU. Thanks. You want to give a quick response to that while we have hands for the next question? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can assure you that the, there are wide ranging public disclosure obligations in the Digital Services Act. Um, that will be made uh, available to everyone. I can also assure you we're very open to uh, conversations uh, with other jurisdictions uh, on, on sharing knowledge and experience uh, around this. Um, so happy, happy to engage with you. We don't intend to solve this by ourselves, nor do we intend to sit on this data, um, certainly not the non-confidential parts uh, of ourselves. Of course, there's part of our work which will be subject to confidentiality rules, but um, uh, the experience that we're learning in the space you know, is something that we are, we're ready to share with other, other regulators and stakeholders around the world. Great, thank you. Um, I'm very eager as a journalist to get my hands on all that data as well. Um, over here in the front. Uh, thank you. Actually, I, I would like to um, add some uh, requirements that uh, 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 I believe it is necessary that uh, uh, be admitted by the uh, digital platforms. Um, uh, declaring and acting and committing to make information available for users, uh, conducting report on criminal offenses committed by cross-border digital platforms, embedding, uh, in, uh, bearing, uh, compliance and redress mechanism and dispute uh, settlement in digital platforms, cooperation with reliable experts for combating against online illegal contents, and complying with regulation related to procedure of sharing information and acting on illegal content, and content moderation in accordance with rules and condition of uh, determined uh, overseeing bodies, prohibiting, prohibiting targeted advertisements to children and advertisement based on exclusive users' uh, characteristics and uh, appointing official and legal uh, representatives and focal points by cross-border digital platforms owners aimed at uh, coordinating respecting requirements of uh, countries in which they have digital presence and where they are providing services to nationals of those countries. There are some uh, requirements that I think helps uh, to uh, uh, digital platforms uh, act in accordance with uh, human rights. Thank you. Um, if there's uh, one more public sector there in the middle. My name is Kita Ocharo from National Cohesion and Integration Commission in Kenya. And our work is to ensure that we uh, make people more cohesive and integrated, ensuring peace. Now, uh, while at our work, we managed to come up with the action plan against state speech. And uh, one of the strategies that we are applying is to ensure that we develop a lexicon, which we did, and it is a live document that every time we keep on updating the new words that we think it is threatening to, to the state of peace in the country. Now, I'm asking what is that position, where can we position that in this kind of discussion? Because already commissions has uh, gotten it uh, very right to ensure that they eliminate and pick the words that are very, very dangerous. Now, how do we, uh, bring that into this conversation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll move to private sector now, if some private sector commentary. I see a hand here in the front, in the black shirt. Yeah. Hi, my name is Farzana Badi. I am the uh, outreach and engagement, the head of outreach and engagement at Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, which is an industry consortium and member companies make certain commitments to address issues related to content and conduct governance uh, in their uh, digital products. And there is an independent assessment process uh, in the works to assess the maturity of implementation of these best practices. Considering the global nature of the internet, we should ensure a consistent approach uh, to content and conduct governance and the international uh, standards and uh, best practice and trust and safety related best practices might actually help uh, to ensure consist this consistent approach and help build uh, capacity for the regulators and uh, other uh, policymakers. Also, in, it's important to emphasize that human rights and risk based based approach can actually work together. Um, risk assessment is also one of the best practices that the companies, uh, the member companies are working on. Uh, we are trying to have a holistic approach with the best practices that considered technical affordances and their impact on trust and safety in a digital product. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over here in the front. Uh, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish. Nosotros somos de la televisión pública en Argentina. Eh, producimos los contenidos interactivos destinados a infancias con otras lógicas que no sean las de mercado. Y vemos que no es solamente un tema de sesgos y de, de, de algoritmos, sino que hay algo en términos técnicos que son las opciones predeterminadas para la acción o para el tipo de interactividad. Entonces, cuando buscamos opciones de interfaces y hardware que puedan ofrecer otras opciones de interactividad, no las encontramos. Encontramos siempre las mismas opciones de interacción que de alguna manera habilitan espacios para la palabra o para la configuración simbólica. Entonces, los movimientos posibles son avanzar, ir hacia atrás, saltar, matar, agarrar. Pero no tenemos otras opciones dentro de las interfaces, y esto es una cuestión más de formatos que de contenidos, donde puedan pasar otras cosas en términos de acción. ¿no? Otras opciones de interactividad que no sean únicamente las que ofrecen las interfaces privativas. Sorry, got my earphone stuck on my glasses. Um, thank you very much. Um, other interventions um, from civil society and, me and media? Uh, I see in the back there uh, with the blue jacket. Thanks a lot. I'm from the London Story, a civil society organization documenting hate speech in India. And we've encountered kind of a twofold technical problem, which is on the one hand, when it comes to content moderation and the automated tools used, the language models that are kind of the state of the art stuff out there, they have way too many false positives, which means they're not useful for automated content moderation. The second technical challenge, though, is that we don't know what the platforms are actually using. We know the best stuff that's out there in the public open source, but we don't know what the platforms are using. So we don't know if it's better, worse, and we can't really tweak it and work with it. And then when platforms say, sorry, we couldn't identify this in this content, we can't verify if that's a technical challenge or if it's a willingness challenge. So I'm wondering to what extent could it be mandated that all of this has to be disclosed? What LLMs are you using? What NLPs are you using? Et cetera, et cetera. Because with the current knowledge, we can't really do our work. That's such a good point. Um, I mean, I definitely feel like most of us would like to know if we're getting, um, if the interactions we're having online are with a bot or, or not. Um, uh, more interventions from civil society um, in the back over there. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm from Purdue University, professor of political science, and I conduct human rights um, impact assessments uh, and due diligence. So I have one question and one comment. So question for Prabhat. Um, so we have these very large online platforms have to conduct human rights due diligence, but includes impact assessments. Um, will, um, so will the commission release these impact assessments publicly and especially to non-European researchers and journalists? Um, so just some clarity specifically about that would be useful. Uh, and secondly, um, a comment about the guidelines, which have included lots of helpful ways to require media literacy for users. We had a great panel on that this morning. But what about also including human rights literacy for tech workers? Uh, this is important because, <laughs> thank you. This is important because effective implementation requires uh, good faith compliance efforts from tech workers, uh, and not just those who work uh, in the legal team or the responsible AI team, right? As we know, these are complex systems, and no one person can do a human rights impact assessment of the entire system themselves. They need uh, their coworkers to have buy-in. Um, so. Uh, thinking a little bit about how we can provide uh, sort of these um, ideas about international human rights principles, uh, you know, thinking about Article 19 or the Ruggie principles and the instruments like the three-part test, uh, and actually convey these in, uh, and, and, and convey this information to the worker so that when we think about human rights by design, they know what human rights we're talking about. Uh, thank you. Hi, okay. Um, hi, I'm Oscar from Ranking Digital Rights, and um, we evaluate digital platforms and telecoms companies on their policies and practices affecting people's rights. Um, and as we have gotten into uh, algorithmic transparency and targeted, trans uh, targeted advertising, uh, we've realized that these black boxes are part of the business model of all these uh, digital platforms. So I guess the first question would be, how can these guidelines help change this? Uh, it's, it would be a really big change in the whole uh, model of how uh, platforms work. And the second point is, uh, we've had a, the free basics fiasco already, uh, and that's almost done, I hope. But uh, there are still countries where uh, there's zero rating policies with telecommunications companies, which uh, pushes users into using certain platforms or uh, giving advantage to certain um, platforms. So it would be important for um, any regulation or guidelines to take that into account, even if uh, telecoms companies are not the core of, uh, of, the, of this guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right here in the middle. Um, thank you. My name is Vincent Obia. I'm a PhD researcher from Birmingham City University. Um, just a question about, um, if you look at section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of the US, that law, that, that clause has for like decades since 1996 actually, defined the um, setting for regulating platforms and social media um, technologies. And now that the, 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 the EU is coming up with the Digital Services Act, it then means that the next paradigm is now shifting to Europe. So Europe is defining the next paradigm, so to speak, of regulation. And I, my question is, for, for, for instance, Africa, which is my area of concern, I'm thinking of the EU now, the African Union. What, can the African Union do to also, I don't know, come up with similar systems and structures to also look at the African input into how platforms can be regulated? What is the AU doing to come up with a similar you know, strategy so that Africa can have a voice and can have a say in how these global platforms are regulated? Thank you. Thank you. And um, we can move into academia and technical community groups. Anyone uh, here in the front? Yeah, sorry, I have spoken before, Joanna Bryce and Heritage School. I just want to make this very quick. I don't want to totally focus on data. I get data is important, but when I think about an audit, I want to go through and see 
what the engineers and what the C-suite are seeing about how their code works. I, I mean, I think that we need to have something that's verifiable, that, that so we understand whether they could even could be doing uh, due diligence, that they understand their obligations, that they show us that they've done the tests, that they've shown us they've done best practice. So let's not forget that. And also, uh, I, I am concerned that we assume that there must be recommenders and algorithms. Some of the great, great experiences in social media uh, have relatively low levels of that. For example, wandering through Wikipedia, but also Twitter for the first sort of five or 10 years. Uh, there was almost no recommenders. Uh, over there in the... Hello, so my name, is, my name is Mada. I'm a software engineer since five years at Twitter. Um, and I just wanted to make a small note. So from my experience, what I, what I learned from Twitter is the fact that the biggest problem on social media is the fact that any single person can create unlimited number of accounts. And because of that, um, there is a lot of uh, bots, there is a lot of um, fake news, and these, fake, these bots are able to manipulate, manipulate the general opinion of the public because they create so many, hundreds of thousands of fake accounts trying to artificially manipulate the general, general opinion of the public. If today we're able to say that one user is one account, then we divide by almost 70% the number of misinformation and problem we see today on social media accounts. So my question is, is the, um, is UNESCO, are, are we trying to oblige a social media network to verify user, making sure that one user is one account? Um, over there in the corner. Hello, my name is Laurie. I'm um, working with a, an organization called Data Rights. Uh, we are using data protection law and cybersecurity. Um, practically also for uh, strategic litigation. Um, I have a comment um, for the EU Commission, but also other authorities in the room. Um, it would be really good to have the publication of guidance on how it is acceptable for the private sector to use the exemptions for publicity uh, based on um, um, sorry, I'm losing my word, on confidentiality and business secrets. These are exemptions that we are seeing are more and more going to be used, and so ourselves and Privacy International are starting to be really worried about how much we can fight this in the context of using freedom of information requests. So, yeah, that would be really, really helpful um, and help lower the costs for civil society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then our last group, our sector, is intergovernmental organizations. Anyone has comments from there? Uh, yeah, in the back. Hello, I'm not from an intergovernmental organization, but I didn't see anybody's hands up, so I'm taking the opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Asha Allen. I'm uh, Advocacy Director for Europe, Online Expression and Civic Space at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, we are uh, an organization who advocates for upholding international human rights in uh, tech policy. Um, so I, I had a very concrete question to all of the, the panelists, um, because we've talked about the Digital Services Act, we've talked about audits and, and uh, concrete due diligence. What do you think needs to be embedded in terms of concrete methodologies and modalities for audits and risk assessments from a human rights uh, perspective to avoid them becoming tick box exercises and becoming a race to the bottom for compliance only requirements but actually embed due diligence. And a follow-up question is, um, how uh, do you conceptualize formally embedding civil society into these processes for accountability for both platforms and for regulators as well? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think if there's not more, uh, I think now we're at the time for the digital intervention, and then we'll go to answers. Um, 
Perfect. Um, merci beaucoup. Alors, nous avons reçu quelques contributions en français pour cette session. Donc, je vais les lire en français. Pour rappel, la question pour cette session était « De nombreuses personnes appellent à une plus grande transparence autour de l'utilisation des algorithmes, notamment dans la conservation de contenu et les systèmes de recommandation. Quelles sont les informations qu'il est techniquement possible pour les plateformes de divulguer et qui seraient significatives pour le public ou pour les régulateurs ?» Alors, nous avons reçu une contribution de la Société civile du Gabon qui disait « Les plateformes doivent divulguer des informations fiables et vérifiables et reposant sur des preuves probantes. Ces informations doivent être aussi précises que possible. La mise en place de tels mécanismes exige que l'on construise des infrastructures de qualité. Cependant, beaucoup de pays ne disposent pas de moyens pour mettre en œuvre ce type d'infrastructure. Nous avons aussi reçu une contribution de la Société civile d'Équateur qui dit « L'accès à l'information détenue par les réseaux sociaux à travers des interfaces de programmation d'applications, ou API en anglais, est nécessaire pour pouvoir réaliser un audit qui permettrait de faire la lumière sur les boîtes noires où fonctionnent les algorithmes. Le cas de Twitter est un bon exemple d'accès aux API. » Merci beaucoup. Okay, great. So we've had our um, interventions, and so now we have an opportunity to respond. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot of things to respond to. Um, I think what I would like to do is s take a few themes and ask people about them, and then we can pick off smaller things that you might want to address. But I think um, I think there's a few things that really uh, jumped out, and I think one that was the sort of meta question that um, I think happens a lot here is like, what is an audit? <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's people asking for, I wanna know which LLM, I wanna see the code, and then there's people who are saying like, how can we make sure we know what the impact is on the ground? And this is a question that arises all the time with algorithmic audits. I've addressed this as a journalist is, you know, you often can't see, because of trade secrets, the algorithm itself, and so you have to rely on sort of the outputs alone, but those can be misleading, as Rinman was saying, that you don't know anything about at, um, intent. Why did it end up that way? And so I'd love to hear the panel talk about sort of what part of the system is actually the part we're trying to audit, um, and start with that. So if you want to kick us off with... The Yes, thanks. I mean, uh, I can just speak for the, uh, maybe quickly the architecture of the Digital Services Act and how audits fit into that. First of all, the audits in the uh, Digital Services Act are compliance audits. And, and so they are meant to independently check whether the different obligations, and there's a big long catalog which includes rec rules on recommender systems and so on, whether they're actually complied with. And just to the audience here, because there's so much interest, I think one of the things that I can announce today is that we will have a public consultation on the um, secondary rules that will define the scope of the audits. And so all of you are invited to contribute to that and have a look at the, at the rule book, which we will make, publish before, we'll make public before it becomes the law. Um, and this is an opportunity to make sure that your, your voice is heard in this process. But there are three layers, I would say, to the, um, to the auditing approach. First, have um, the rules all been complied to with some degree of assurance? Second, are the right internal processes in place to, for example, on the um, risk assessments, have to identify the right risks and then to mitigate them? And then the third, are the technical um, specifications available to a third party and verifiable so that claims that are made under the Digital Services Act can be independently verified? So that's, it's not just about al auditing algorithms, also auditing about the internal organization. I think some of the panel, some of the audience already mentioned the importance of, you know, content moderation flows, you know, uh, different languages in which uh, content has to be moderated and so on. So, so all of that is in scope of the GSA audits, which are not just limited to kind of 
uh, auditing the algorithm, you know, it, itself. So it's also an organizational audit. I think that's that's maybe the one point I, I want to make here. And then maybe I just use that to make one final point: is that um, there was a question on whether the um, human rights impact assessments or will be made public. Yes, they will be made public. Um, they also the audit reports will be made public, and the miti mitigation measures. And, and actually, there's a whole range of of, um, of transparency reports. And, and the reasons why we did that was that we did not want this to be an exclusive conversation between the European regulatory system and the platforms. This needs to be a public conversation involving many people, and, and even people from outside of the EU. And that's why there are these very wide-ranging public disclosure obligations in the, in, in the, probably more than anyone can digest. But one way of thinking about the, the DSA is like those diagnostics in the hospital, you know, that, that, that you put sensors on the patient, you know, and then you get all sorts of data. And the doctor will not look at every data point, but a well-trained doctor will know what to look for. And we're trying to create with the Digital Services Act this diagnostic system, but we'll need many eyes in the beginning to understand um, what, what kind of um, problems we encounter and what the remedies might be. we just go down the line. Um, so thank you, uh, Prabhat. And, and I think you know the high-level questions are really important here, and the what is an audit question. Um, it's something I tackled at Twitter. It's something I'm tackling now moving forward. And there are a couple of challenges. So I, I'm not going to sit here and be prescriptive on what an audit should be. But what I will say is there are certain things one needs to think about when conducting an audit. Uh, one very important one is timeliness. Um, and in other words, you know, often when traditional assessments are conducted, it may take months or even years. And also, these audits often take place after a harm has occurred. Now, with the DSA, you know, there is now there is an attempt to make these proactive. But one of the challenges to think about is if we are thinking about auditing multiple different algorithmic systems. I'm going to talk about that in a second as well. Uh, what is the time frame in which we need to do this, and do we have the resourcing to do it? Second, related to resourcing, is what is the composition of the team? Um, so I truly believe that you know, in order to address a lot of the concerns raised today we do need to build interdisciplinary teams. Now, what interdisciplinary means changes quite a bit. And also, not just the team doing the assessment, but the team on the other side in the company. So one of the things I actually feel quite strongly about is that there need to be technical control owners. As in, if I'm on the external group auditing, the people I should be talking to should be model owners and technical leaders, not just policy and legal folks because um, it's really critical to get into the weeds of how these systems are built uh, by the people who have built them. And the last thing to think about, and this is where I said I'm going to put a pin in the word algorithmic system. So today we use these words interchangeably, algorithm, model, and algorithmic system, but they are actually wildly different things. Um, so for example, one of the biggest challenges we will have is identifying what constitutes an algorithmic system, which is actually what the DSA says to audit. And so is Twitter an algorithmic system? Well, you have a singular experience, but most people who have worked at Twitter will say no. Twitter is actually comprised of many different systems. Now, that does not mean a single model is a system. It is not. A system is an interplay of multiple different models working in tandem. Why am I getting into technical weeds? Because as we choose what to audit, we don't just need context in how these systems are being used in society. We also need the context in which these systems are used with each other. So multiple models acting in concert is an algorithmic system. Multiple system pulled together is your online experience on a particular platform. And that's a very critical thing we're going to have to dissect because that actually determines the level of analysis. The only other thing I'll add is what is going to happen is what we have seen in many regulatory environments. We're going to get a lot of disparate regulations sometimes disagreeing with each other. And you know, I would like to put out there today that we, we need some sort of a global Basel Accords for algorithmic regulation, because companies act at a global scale. Governments don't always act at a global scale. And the DSA is a great start to thinking through global regulation, what they should look like. But as our colleague uh, discussing the African Union said, you know, this, may be, this may result in laws being imposed in other parts of the world. So what might it look like, and I invite all of us to think about, what might it look like to have an algorithmic audit or algorithmic assessment Basel Accords? Thanks a lot. <coughs> Sorry about that. 
so when we were speaking about the risk assessment, it is really important to know who is defining the criteria and who is implementing the, ring, uh, the um, uh, risk assessments. Uh, but then what happens next? There was a question whether the reports are public. Even if they are public, what happens afterwards? So we have recommendations from UNESCO, from other organizations, but are these recommendations binding? So what is the role of the government afterwards? And it was great what you mentioned. What is the aim of the government to control, to regulate? And then I really liked the colleague from the NGO when she was mentioning, and I started today with that, uh, are we uh, start from the point of regulation or are we starting at the origin? So I really appreciated this idea of human rights literacy for tech workers. So we can speak about uh, global regulation, but we can also speak about global international human rights principles. And if we are successful in that, so if we are success, if we manage uh, to have um, literate tech workers, human rights literate tech workers, maybe then also the necessity for regulation will not be as such. So this is what I started at the beginning and you held me afterwards. So I say it is both. I think it's too late to consider only the regulation part, but maybe we should consider how we can uh, agree together on uh, what are the principles of the human rights. Thank you. I wanted also to confirm what you said regarding the layers. It's very important because the regulation, since our subject is the regulation, I think that uh, we heard about, first of all, a minimum of self-regulation is important. We cannot uh, leave the task on the regulator itself. And this is part of the regulation. To, when we talk, for example, I, I'm going to give for cybersecurity, when we say cybersecurity by design, safety by design, regulated a little bit by design. So it's very important to start at the design phase, based on your infrastructure. I'm sorry, I want to give an example of countries who are not very well established, I mean, and where you have digital divide, fracture numérique. So even it will affect the quantity, the nat nature of data, even in terms of content. And also, you need a mature civil society also uh, to be able to have a common governmental and civil society and industrial. You know that industrials are uh, way beyond all of us in terms of techniques and technology. So uh, learning and teaches, teaching process, this is a very big load on academician. We don't have to forget that most of uh, courses, uh, university courses, shall follow uh, in order to secure regulation, to secure. And uh, when it comes to algorithm, I agree with you, we cannot let them alone. They are data related also. Gathering data, the way you are classifying the data affect sometimes the work of the alg algorithm. So it's a teaching process, machine learning uh, 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 control and so on. So the problem is that there's, it's um, multidisciplinary and that's why interdisciplinary is a must because uh, in, in, in artificial intelligence you might find uh, also psychological uh, way of uh, dealing with things. So interdisciplinary is uh, something very important that we have to raise awareness, technicians and social uh, community and even children uh, regarding all the, uh, the involved uh, uh, sectors in making digital platforms and secure human rights. So uh, it's a long process and end to end. It's not only just what is written in the law, also in the processes. Thank you. Um, we're somewhat assuming that regulators um, are independent, well resourced, and willing to do what they're supposed to do. And this is not true for many regulators. In fact, um, I can give examples of a country where we work in, I don't want to mention the name of the country, um, where the regulator was appointed before the bill became the law, right? Um, and so the 
regulator, the head of the regulatory agency was appointed uh, by the executive before the bill even went to parliament. So it's, I mean, that's not gonna be independent. Um, and how well resourced it is depends on how well it cooperates with the executive. And so this is absolutely why it's important to make sure that it does not rely alone on regulators. This is not just because I work in civil society, but this is because this is why civil society must be involved. Um, and, and I like the question about how you know, we can look into this black box. The UNESCO guideline, thankfully, uh, the second draft, says that we need to open up these black boxes for research purposes. Because otherwise, we're supposed to take your word for it. And that's, that's, that's not going to be the case. So I think it's important for us not to make the assumption that all regulators will be independent because many of them will not be independent. And where they are not, then who watches the biased umpire? That's civil society. That's researchers. That's the media. It's important. Thank you. And you are really um, preaching to my biased interests as a journalist, um, you know, the DSA opens up um, platforms to researcher access, but not to journalists. And I feel as a, that journalists should also be involved because we operate on a faster timeline than most academics. And the questions we ask are different. The questions we ask of the data are much more about accountability and less about um, proving a novel theorem. And so I think journalists are, should be part of this conversation, so I'm just throwing my own <laughs> weight into this, um, because we are um, often like only counterweight right, to a corporation and a regulator that might not be that independent, and then the researchers who are gonna tell you that it was really bad but five years from now. Um, so we don't have uh, any time left, so we're gonna move to um, another round of stakeholder input. Um, if there are some perspectives that we're missing up here, um, please raise your hand. And I see one right here in the front, blue shirt. Hello, yeah, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Manuel Antonio Monteudo. I work with the Media Literacy Organization in Peru. But I will provide my insight as an artist, basically. Uh, well, there is a subject, I think maybe the battle is already lost, but I think there is the battlefield of language. I think the word content has been very harmful for artists. Uh, there is, I am 30 years old and in my generation there is a growing interest for lost media. I think there is a lot of uh, creations, creative videos for example, which have been lost because they are considered as barely content. And uh, I think there may be a conversation to be had about the definition of art, art in the internet, art that is created in the new media. How do you protect that? How do you prevent it from disappearing forever? I, I, uh, it may sound funny, but there is a whole community of young people who are dedicated to finding con content that has been uh, disappeared because it was considered content instead of art. Is this a subject to be explored? I do think it is, <laughs> but I leave the conversation to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all the way in the back under the windows. Thank you for the possible opportunity. Um, I've made a summary comment yesterday. We need to make sure that in your recommendations you don't only look at the past but, and today, but at the technology of the future. My name is Fritz Israel. I work for AGI Tech uh, Laboratory. And we are actually a small company that is developing technology that's transparent, rely, uh, reliable, and much more efficient than all of the AI technology that we know so far. But just that if you are developing something that's uh, going to guide the industry into the future, that you consider that the technologies of today are probably not going to be the technologies of tomorrow or the week after. Thank you. Uh, oh, they're waving a book or something. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jessica Field from the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. Um, I had asked a question yesterday of um, UNESCO staff, fast staffers who are responsible for the drafting around um, accounting for uh, how the draft guidelines would apply to existing or draft regulation. Um, I would be very curious to hear um, from Pravat and, and our um, uh, 
the Slovenian panelist, about how um, the uh, draft guidelines would be helpful in interpreting the DSA, and if so, how, and if not, why not, um, or um, in the case of Slovenia, how they might be helpful going forward. Um, over here in the gray shirt. Hello, um, I'm Peter O'Brien from France 24, the TV news channel. Um, I had a question for Ruman Chowdhury. I was just a bit curi curious to know more about how, when you're at t Twitter, you defined uh, this, uh, defined what was center right content in that um, uh, study you were undergoing. Um, were we talking about content that uh, was promoting center right points of view, or were simply talking about uh, center right issues? Um, if you can just give us a bit more insight into how that works, that would be great. Um, I think there was someone right behind you, yeah, there. Hi, my name is Ben Grazda, um, and I work in tech justice, tech accountability. Um, and so I just had a question about um, outsourced content moderators and how the data that they look at feeds into algorithms. And so, you know, we heard from Daniel um, yesterday about uh, the work that he did. And so does the data uh, that content moderators, especially outsourced content moderators do, feed into algorithms? Um, that tech companies use to moderate content. Um, and I think that, you know, we've been talking about uh, human versus automated content moderation, but, but those systems are obviously linked, so it'd be interesting to hear any people's comments about looking at kind of content moderation more systemically versus human versus um, automated content moderation. Thanks. Oh, over here, waving. Thank you, sorry about the wave. Uh, my name is Sarah Andrew, I'm from the Avaz Foundation, uh, which is a member-led organization, and so I'm not gonna add to the many excellent comments that have been made about civil society's need for meaningful access to data, but I do want to talk about a constituency I haven't heard yet mentioned, which is the users. What would be meaningful to users? And I'd like to make two suggestions, and I would love to understand any, any ways to make this content meaningful. But users would like to understand how they are tracked and surveilled by the uh, platforms that collect their data. And I think any ways that that could be made visible in a meaningful way beyond a tick box when you first enter and consent to the collection of your data. And I think the second incredibly important um, area for users to have meaningful transparency on is the actions that platforms undertake with the content they create or the content from their favorite creators. So when that content is downranked or otherwise invisibly interacted with by platforms, I think it's incredibly important that we find meaningful ways in order to explain what's happened to that content. That is one of the very few bulwarks we have to protect freedom of speech when we're talking about regulation of content on the internet. Thank you. Thank you. This is flashing red at me, so I think um, I'm supposed to be moving back to the online piece. So hopefully the online people will pop up from virtual reality where they are in the metaverse. <laughs> Thank you and apologies for the, the slight technical glitch. Um, so we received an interesting uh, contribution as well from uh, civil society in Ecuador which was saying the UN should facilitate a channel where the algorithmic biases that can be evidenced via research can become a force for positive change in network algorithms, as it currently takes years from discovery to comment on their impact. We also received uh, another comment from Brazil, uh, again from civil society, regarding, um, which was reading, the conference and this particular panel did not delve into how normative principles translate into the structured, process-based, complex, fast-paced, and systemic environment of digital platforms. Wider transparency and understanding on which technical um, trade-offs the implement, sorry, wider transparency and understanding on which technical trade-offs the implementation of normative principles is lacking. For instance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, social media platforms had to decide how to moderate pieces of content on COVID. These are both potentially harmful if dis-misinformative and potentially of public utility if accurate and related to prevention and healthcare. In removing or decreasing 
virality of content, platforms had to decide on a trade-off between false positives and false negatives. In simpler terms, to over-remove or under-remove content. It would be valuable to map out a taxonomy of technical trade-offs that are fundamentally ingrained in content moderation and particular to major events, such as time of crisis, for example, a pandemic, elections, civil unrest, for example, protests, institution disruption, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we don't have very much time left, but there were some, a few questions that I thought it might be just worth having quick answers to. So for you, Prabhat, there were just two, um, how are the draft guidelines influencing the DSA implementation? And will data about the outside, outsource content work moderators' actions be part of the um, transparency? So um, thanks. Um, the DSA I can, is now hard law, and that hard law part cannot be changed other than through another renewed legislative process. So that part can no longer be changed. But um, there are other areas where we're seeking um, additional guidance. Um, so I mentioned the way that the audits will be conducted. There will be a, uh, a consultation on that. There will be a consultation on on the piece that was mentioned on how the modalities of data access for researchers were actually going to work in practice. So the law itself provides for the rule, but how exactly it needs to be implemented, this is something that we're seeking views on. And then there's a whole range of guidelines uh, that uh, cover where the commission can issue further guidance. Some of them were already requested. So those, uh, what we sometimes in our own jargon call softer parts, because they don't go through a renewed democratic decision-making process, they can still be modified and consulted upon, and, and some parts of the UNESCO guidelines speak to m what I would call more the softer parts. But the part that mirrors or echoes the hard part of the DSA, uh, you know, that, that I think my sense is that the direction was more the other way around. I think that the drafters of the guidelines were looking to the DSA and then saying, well, what are the good things that we want, want to put into the, into the guidelines? And, and of course, we welcome that. But, but I also echo, and I want to emphasize this, that we are mindful that different jurisdictions have different constitutional setups, have different makeups of, of civil society, have different technical capacities. And, and so my plea will be, that as we go forward, that we take these nuances into account and that, that we have sufficient safeguards and openness and empowerment programs to accompany that, what works in the EU, EU and we have yet to see how it will work. You know, this is a very fresh piece of law. Um, you know, is, 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 is probably good in principle because it's based on international human rights standards, but in its projection on, on the details, you know, needs to be nuanced. Um, and just in the way that many interventions here have, uh, have made it clear. On the content moderation, we have a, a, a geographical limit on the EU content moderation in the, um, in the jurisdictional limits are, are, are generally, lim you know, we can only make rules about the EU in, in the EU. Um, so we do have a disclosure requirement on content moderation resources per language in the EU. And exactly, and they are also subject to audits. So um, it's not a, a direct disclosure obligation how many outsourced content moderators are you using. But if we have questions on that, we do have powers to get that information. And that information then is also subject to audits. Thank you so much. Well, I think we are out of time because it's flashing giant red at me, um, so, um, but I do wanna say just thank you so much for this wonderful conversation and I think it's really just important to remember that this can f sound very abstract and dry but like the stakes are really high for all of us. Um, we have companies that govern global speech essentially, they're larger than any government and they are as of yet somewhat um, it's really up to them if they want to take um, citizens' input <laughs> about their decisions. And, and the exercise of UNESCO and the DSA are an attempt to bring um, government, and by 
actually the people who the governments represent into that conversation with the tech companies. And so it's very important for all of us that these experiments go well. And so I think it's really wonderful to have all these great minds involved. So thank you very much.